Hello everybody, I'm Nick and in this video I'm going to show you how you can make any c -sharp type in your .NET codebase parsable. Now, this was technically possible before .NET 7, but with the release of .NET 7 and c -sharp 11, this just completely changed and is made way more consistent and way easier as well. It's something I've been using in my own codebase for the past eight months now and I want to show you what I'm doing, why I'm doing it and explain why it's a better solution than what we had before. If you like the content and you want to see more, make sure you subscribe, ring the notification bell, and for more training, check out my courses on dometrain.com. All right, let me show you what I have here. I have a simple .NET 8 console application. I'm on .NET 8 Preview 5 as of the release of this video, but all you need is .NET 7 for this to actually work, and C Sharp 11, of course. Now, let me show you what this is about fundamentally. We have here some a number as text, and this ultimately is about converting some text to some type and parsing that text into some type. So for example, I might have just a random number here, and over here I might want to parse that number as an integer. What I might do in pre.NET 7 times is int.parse and just parse that number, and then I can say console.writeline number as int, and if I was to run this you're going to see that value printed in the console, and that's it. Now, if you wanted that number, to be represented as a double because it can be passed as a double you can say pause and you can have that same thing over here we can copy this here just run it same idea the same values printed just as a double this time now what i'm going to do is actually downgrade this project to dotnet 6 to begin with so dotnet 6 goes here and dotnet 6 uh, goes here as well here we go so not .NET 8 nothing preview no nothing and I want to go into the parse method to see exactly what's really behind that method so as you can see it is just a static method called parse in the int32.cs class which is where uh, the integer is located in those times anyway now as you can see the int32 type implements a few interfaces i comparable convertible uh, span formatable and a few other things but it does not as of the release of that version implement anything specific to the parsing so as far as this parse method is concerned it is just a static method in that class and by the way you also have the try parse variant this is still falling under the same category and same idea we're just going to use parse in this video but everything we do for parse is applicable for try parse as well now if i upgrade this project to use the dotnet 7 sdk and .NET 7 in the properties as well. So now it is going to be a .NET 7 project. What I'm going to do is just quickly rebuild so the right packages are pulled and I'm gonna go into that same parse method. And now take a look at this. Even though this is still a static int parse method, if I scroll all the way up, you're gonna see that this is now changed. Previously, if you remember, we had the flag saying generic math enabled. This is how the static abstract members was called before it was released officially in C Sharp 11 as an out of preview feature. But take a look at what's happening here. Now, on top of everything else, we have some other interfaces like I sign number, I min max value, and I binary integer. If we go into this iBinary integer, we're going to another interface which implements the iBinary number, which if I go into that, implements the i number, which if we go into that, implements the number base, which if we go into that, implements i span possible, which if we go into that, implements i possible. And now, because we have static abstract members on interfaces, these parse and try parse methods are actually static members of that interface. And int is not unique in having this value. In fact, good, long, double, all of those things that could be parsed now are rooted in this interface with this static abstract member. Why is that important? Well, it's important because now all of them have the same sort of interface and the way they act. But it's also important because now you can do something like this. I can go ahead and I can make a public static parsable extensions class if I wanted to. And I can say that I want a public static method here that returns generic t called parse. And then I can use t here. And then the input value is an extension on string, which is the same as any parse method. And then we have the input here. And then we also have the i formatable provider parameter, which will be null by default, uh, which is also another element in these methods. If I go comma here, you're going to see that we accept this i format provider uh, interface which is nullable. Now this method can actually have a WHERE clause where I say that WHERE T is actually an I parsable of type T. So if I do that what I can say because of that new feature is T dot 
pause and then pause the input and the provider. And that is it. I'm going to say format provider over here. And now instead of having this int dot pause or double dot pause or whatever, both of them can have an extension method called pause. And then I say pause this as an integer. And because they do implement the iPossible interface in their own types, both double and int does that, I can do the same here and say pause this as an integer and pause this as a double, which to me just reads way better than having to do int dot whatever, double dot whatever. This generic approach is very neat, very nice. You can have the same if you use I span formatable, if you want to use span as the input method, which is also an option. Uh, of course, for that to be optimal, you have to change this to a read only span of type character. So you're going to have something like this. But if you are to do that, then the way you're processing those has to match that. So you might have to say as span here and so on. I'm going to revert it back to string because string is easier to work with and it's something everyone understands. But if you want to work with span, that's also something you can do. Now to put everything into perspective to explain why that is so cool. Imagine the following. I'm going to go ahead and create a new record. I'm going to call that point 2D, a point in 2D space. And I'm going to have an X and a Y axis. So I'm going to say int X and int Y over here. Now, if I just leave this as it is, I'm going to have to instantiate this object with a constructor. However, what I can do is say that now this is of I possible of type point 2D, its own type. And the moment I do that, I have to implement the two missing members, the pause method and the try pause method. Now, all you need to do to use these methods is actually take that string and write a method that converts that string to that type, a new instantiation of point 2D. I'm going to just change this to be null by default because we might not want to provide it. And we provide a better experience by just setting it to null by default so you don't have to explicitly return null on the front end. And now since I have that, all I need to say is split text equals s dot split. And we're going to split on a comma. So the input we want to have is something like this, for example. And we're going to return that into a point 2D. So we're going to say split text and then we split on that and then x equals split text the first value and we're going to say int dot pause of course we could just leverage what we just did and say pause to an integer which in my opinion looks pretty nice and pretty neat and then we can say return point 2d and x and y is back and of course i have to say new here and that is it so now what's going to happen is if someone says that the input that i have here number of text is these two parameters comma separated. I'm going to say that point 2D equals number as text, pause. And because point 2D does implement that interface, it is going to allow me to do that. Now, it doesn't like this because this doesn't implement I span possible. That's just the case because I did not roll back this change. The moment I do, this is now acceptable. And if I do that, and if I run this code base, then as you can see, the point is converted and it is passed from that comma separated string to that type. Now, I could, of course, uh, implement the try pass method in a very similar way. I'm going to have a try and then a catch over here. And then I'm going to say that this is the original passing over here. This is definitely not null. This has to be result equals new and then return true. And then we can set a default value if we want for the point for the default version, because this is not nullable. So I can say something else and then return false. And that is it. Now I have my try pause implementation and my pause implementation. Now I kind of did spoil that already, but you can actually use spans as well here instead of strings to be way more optimal with your processing. Because if you do split like this here, I just create two more strings over here and an array allocation, which is not optimal. It's three things that I could really do without. So the way to prevent that and not have it at all is just change this I possible to I span possible, which internally does already implement the I possible. So you're going to have to implement both effectively. So now I'm going to go ahead and implement the missing members, which is the pause method and the try pause method of the read only span version. And now I'm going to do the exact same thing as I had before, but the sort of API of span changes a bit the things because now it's a read only span of character. So I don't really have this split method. What I have instead is ranges and offsets. But what I'm going to do in this case, since I am on .NET 8, or at least I have it installed, is move to .NET 8 and upgrade both my project and my solution to them. 
And if I do that and I use the latest preview, we actually have a new split method coming. Now, it's a very interesting interface. You don't just pass in the parameter and that is it. You actually need a destination span to write to. So what I'm going to do here is say that I have a span of type range and that is my destination uh, span. And I'm going to stack allocate a span of type range with uh, two parameters, two spaces, because I have X and I have Y. That's effectively what I'm doing here. And I'm going to say destination goes here, comma, and then the character I want to split on, which is the same comma separated thing. And now this bit with X and Y becomes a bit trickier to understand, but I'm going to explain what's happening. X now is int.parse of that original span, and then the first range in the span of ranges. So destination, first, and that is it. This will give me the first value, and the Y is the second one. And that is it. And just to show you uh, how this works, I'm going to go here and say that this is actually a span. So I'm going to say point to D dot pause, and I'm going to put the span in here. And now, as you can see, this will go into the span. And if I go ahead and I run this, this will be processed. And if I just change the parameters as well, this will also be processed absolutely fine. They're just passed through the ranges and allocations are kept to a minimal amount. In fact, there is no heap allocations here. This is stack allocated range. We have the split uh, on the text, which by the way, we don't really need this because this tells you how many things you split on. And then we have the int.pass that is also using a span over here. So we really minimized all the allocations here. This is very, very efficient. If you care about performance and you want to implement parsing, you want to use the parse methods that use the read-only spans over here. And then the idea about the try parse method is effectively the same. We just add an exception if you don't split on exactly two parameters. And that is it. And now you can add this implementation to any of your types, implement it in any way that you want, and pause any type, especially if you're using things like minimal APIs or any sort of API that has some input of some string and you want to convert it to a concrete type. Previously, we had to do duct typing, but now we can actually use the iPassable interface and it's just way, way better. It's a very underappreciated feature and it's only when you need it that you really appreciate it. But as someone who is doing text parsing quite a bit, this is just such an amazing way to deal with this problem and solve it. Now, whether you want to make your own extensions or not is completely up to you, but the fact that we now have these static abstract members makes it so easy to do, and I absolutely love this approach. But now I want to know from you, how are you doing your pausing? Did you know about this interface and are you using it? Leave a comment down below and let me know. Well, that's all I have for you for this video. Thank you very much for watching. Special thanks to my Patreons for making videos possible. If you want to support me, you're going to find the link in the description down below. Leave a like if you like this video, subscribe more, click the like, hit the bell as well, and I'll see you in the next video. Keep coding.